distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Jagdish, respected uh, uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor V S Rao, respected Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor D Narayan Rao, and uh, my fellow colleagues and dear participant, a very good morning and a warm welcome to the University Distinguished Lecture of SRM University, Andhra Pradesh. Now I invite Professor D Narayan Rao, Pro Vice mm -hmm. Chancellor, to deliver the a welcome address. Highly accomplished scientist of international repute, recipient of Australia's highest civilian honor, AC Companion of the Order of Australia, President elect of Australian Academy of Science, advisor to Australian Parliament, and the distinguished speaker, Prof. Chinupati Jagadish Garu. Our beloved Vice Chancellor, Professor V.S. Rao Garu, Deans, Directors, Learned Faculty Members, Research Scholars, and the bright and young students of SRM AP, participants from several universities, institutions, national laboratories from India and abroad, members of print and electronic media, invitees, ladies and gentlemen, I extend a warm welcome to all of you to the University Distinguished Lecture titled Semiconductor Nanostructures for Optoelectronic Applications being delivered by the illustrious scientist, Professor Chinnupati Jagadish. You are all aware that semiconductors have played and are playing very significant and important role in the development of information and communication technology, ICT, solar cells, photodiodes, LEDs, optical fiber, laser diodes, and many more devices. We're all aware that science, technology, and innovation are the key drivers for wealth generation, quality of life, and national security. India is moving ahead on a sustainable development pathway for achieving Bharat, self-reliant India. A great emphasis is being given for developing indigenous technologies and encourage grassroots innovations. The policy aims to promote technology self-reliance and indigenization to achieve the larger goal of Atmanirbhar Bharat. In the inaugural address, on the Indian Science Congress held at Bangalore in January 2020, the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji emphatically mentioned innovate, patent, produce, and prosper. He emphasized the need for translating academic research into a product with societal impact. Thus, many institutions and universities in the country are now focusing on translational research and development of products wherever applicable. It's very gratifying to know that several illustrious Indians are leading the world famous companies founded abroad and receiving international recognitions. Professor Jagdish is an illustrious example who excelled in science and technology and received outstanding international recognitions, honors and awards. Professor Jagdish Garu, we are highly grateful to you for kindly accepting our invitation. And also, you are a role model for many of the scientists and technologies of this country of different age groups. Some of them are now attending this lecture. India is aiming at quantum jump and not looking at incremental increase. Those days have gone. India is moving fast towards 5 trillion US dollar economy from the present to 3 trillion US dollar economy. In the next few years, we may overtake the economy of Japan. It is to be realized that no country has achieved self-reliance without education of high quality and research and development. Thus, the government of India now attaches great importance and emphasis for education and research. National Education Policy 2020 deals with education in a detailed way and the country is poised towards uh, accomplishing 
in higher education in the country. We need to develop our own goods with superior technology at affordable cost. Indian products could attain international reputation through state of the art research and development. Thus, the younger generation of today have abundant opportunities, which the earlier generations did not have. I repeat, the younger generation of today have abundant opportunities, which the earlier generations did not have. Of course, they need to develop the needed skills for the emerging technologies and work toward with passion and commitment. Now it is India's turn. All of us know that our time has come. I'm very confident that our time has come and India is all set to regain its due place in the Committee of Nations. For information of our chief guest, Professor Jagadish, and other members present here, I wish to inform you that SR University Andhra Pradesh is established in July 2017, about four years back, as a multi-stream research intensive university. Presently, we are offering BTEC and MTEC programs in different disciplines, and we have about 5,600 students from different parts of the country and a few students who are foreign nationals. 190 students including a few net qualified have enrolled for PhD programs in different disciplines. We have appointed 200 faculty members having PhD degrees from premier institutes such as IITs, IASC, and reputed foreign universities. Four DST inspired faculty members, one DBT Ramalingasan fellow, and one Sri Ramas Ramajan fellow are working at SRAP as faculty members. In the year 2018, we have started School of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, and also School of Entrepreneurship and Management to provide holistic education as envisaged by the National Education Policy 2020. Our faculty members are quite active in research and have published more than 600 papers during the last two years in highly reputed journals, including Nature, Nature Communications, Nature Microbiology, Proceedings of National Academy of CPNAS, IEEE Transactions, and other reputed journals. Some of our faculty members have published 20 papers in Nature Index journals. Dr. Karthik Rajendran, Dr. Imran Pancha, and Dr. Lakvir Singh were recognized among the top 2% scientists of the world as compiled by Stanford University. Our faculty members have received 46 sponsored research projects from the Department of Science and Technology, DST, the Department of Biotechnology, DBT, National Supercomputing Mission, NSM, Defense Research Development Organization, DRDO, Board of Research in Nuclear Science, BRNS, UGC, DAE, and a few industries. One faculty member, Dr. Sudarshan Govindrajan, received the prestigious DBT Welcome Trust Award. We have established SRM Amarraja Center for Energy Storage Devices, jointly with Amarraja Batteries Limited, the leading battery manufacturer in the country. We also established Center for Weather Forecast in association with India Meteorological Department, IMD. The center is providing weather forecast for the entire state of Andhra Pradesh. We have taken up a, special, a few special projects, development of gold foam for jewelry applications in collaboration with Tanishku Jewelers of Titan Industries, Hari Vaman Pete of Maharashtra. Professor Vinod Kumar is the pioneer in developing gold forms for jewel applications. 3D printing of gold jewelry, once again in association with Tanishku Jewelers. We have initiated 3D printing of bio implants in association with Concordia University of Canada and All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Ames, Mangalagiri. Metal IT manufacturing for strategic applications in collaboration with IIT Hyderabad, IIT Jodhpur, and ARCA Hyderabad. At SRM University, we provide the students research-based learning for knowledge creation and innovative ideas. Further, we train the students with a desire to do and with a desire to learn and enable them to take up challenge tasks that they encounter in their careers in the decades to come. To recognize that the student's knowledge 
base must be sufficiently flexible to cope up with the 21st job scenario. Training the students or tailoring to the existing jobs of today is suboptimal and even counterproductive. Thus, we train the students that they can take up challenging tasks and with 21st century job skills. We do well realize that universities are viewed as creators of new knowledge, innovative ideas, providers of talented and skilled manpower to the world. Today, India is providing skilled manpower to India and many other nations in a few continents. Agents for social changes, symbols of international attention and prestige. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and Jai Vigyan. Thank you one and all. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Sujit Kalori to introduce our distinguished speaker. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Vinod. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Chenupati Jagdish, uh, who is my professional mentor. And also Professor Jagadish is a distinguished professor and head of semiconductor Opel electronics and nanotechnology group in the research school of physics at Australian National University. Professor Jagadish is the editor in chief of applied physics reviews impact factor 90.162 and editor of three book series and serves on editorial boards of 19 other journals. He has published more than 1,000 research papers and among 710 journal papers, holds six US patents, co-authored a book, co-edited 15 books, and edited 12 conference proceedings and 20 special issues of journals. He is a fellow of 11 science and engineering academies in USA, Australia, Europe, India, and 14 professional societies such as IEEE, MRS, APS, etc. He received many awards, including IEEE Pioneer Award in Nanotechnology, IEEE Photonics Society Engineering Achievement Award, OSA Nick Hollyan Award, IUMRS Somia Award, UNESCO Medal for his contributions to the development of nanoscience and nanotechnologies and Laila Medal from Australian Academy of Science for his contributions to physics. He has received Australia's highest civilian honor, AC Companion of the Order of Australia, which is equivalent to Bharat Ratna in India for his contributions to physics and engineering, in particular nanotechnology. He has been elected as president of the Australian Academy of Science and he is the first Australian of Indian heritage in this role. And uh, thank you, Professor Jagdish. Uh, now we request you to give your lecture. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sujit, for the kind introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor V.S. Rao, the Vice Chancellor of the University, and Professor Dean Arayan Rao, the Vice Chancellor of the University, and the deans and directors and faculty for inviting me to participate in this uh, very prestigious University Dis Distinguished Lecture Series. And uh, I also want to thank the students for joining us because uh, really this talk is for the young faculty and the students because the senior people know about uh, these fields. And then I'm very much uh, really looking forward to interacting with them as well. That again, thank you for your kind, uh, you, know, and, you, know, you know, kind words. And also congratulations to all of you for uh, what you've achieved during such a short period of time. And I think uh, you, you've got a bright future ahead of you and good luck to all of you in terms of achieving bigger and better things, and particularly in terms of training and educating lots of young people coming particularly from the rural areas and where the, the opportunities are limited. And as Professor Narayan Rao mentioned that the generations where we live and then the opportunities were very limited for us, but now, the opportunities are enormous and then the sky is the limit and I'm sure that all of you have got a bright future ahead of you with that. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about semiconductor nanostructures for optical electronics applications. In addition to being at the Australian National University, I have honorary appointments in India, Japan, China, Taiwan, US and UK, 
I really want to thank my colleagues for inviting me to be associated with their universities, and it's been a real pleasure for me to be associated with those institutions. And uh, so really, today's talk uh, is a collective effort between my group at the Australian National University, many groups in India, uh, Australia, US, UK, China, Sweden, Italy, Russia, Switzerland. The beauty of science is that there are no national boundaries. We can all work together. And uh, so it's been a great pleasure for me to work with my colleagues in various parts of the world, and particularly with many students and postdoctoral fellows in these groups, because it's been a really collective effort and I want to thank them for their all their contributions. I also want to take this opportunity to thank my group members. And uh, typically we've got 10 to 12 nationalities at any one time. These are bright young people. And it's been a real pleasure for me to working with all of them. I want to sincerely thank them. And many of them are also from India. And also I want to thank my colleagues, uh, academic colleagues in the group and those who are leading various aspects of our research. And I want to thank them for their leadership as well. And also our funding agencies for providing uh, some funding, allowing, allowing, allowing us to have fun. And uh, it's uh, without that funding, we will not be able to have fun, which is not good for us. So here's the overview of my talk, and I'll give you the motivation why we're interested in semiconductor nanostructures and semiconductors and optoelectronics. And then I'll talk about the growth of the nanowires and nanostructures, and uh, so the various wide variety of devices which we are really making use of these in nanostructures, and I'll draw some conclusions. Before proceeding further, I would like to thank many groups, those are working in various parts of the world, including India, for those who are working in the field of nanowires and nanostructures for their contributions to our discipline, because we learn from each other. And then the knowledge has been built based on others' contributions. And if their contributions are not there, we'll be poorer than uh, what we are today. So I really want to thank all of them for their contributions to these, these, these particular areas of research we are working. So before proceeding, I'm telling you about nanostructures and let's really look at the technological revolution and how they are transforming the world and the society. As most of you know that the first uh, technological revolution started with the steam power and leading to mechanization. Second industrial revolution started with electrical power and mass production. And third industrial revolution started with computer power and automation. And fourth industrial revolution, people are expecting that the digital world and then the biological world will come together and uh, the light is going to play an important role because 90% of the information which we receive is through light. Okay. Light-based technologies and optical and photonics-based technologies currently of industry is about $1 trillion. People are predicting that uh, these, these industries will be doubling uh, by 2030 or so. That means there's a lot of opportunities for all of us to be able to make contributions. And then hopefully some of you Will be, some of, of you are going to develop new technologies, which could lead to starting of new companies or so, as Professor Narendra mentioned, that is really important for self-reliant India, as Prime Minister has been really talking about, and then developing new technologies, young people starting new companies and all things really becomes very important for the future of the country as well. So in terms of the needs of the World Economic Forum has identified, the needs of the, in 2018, needs of the future. They've identified holographic displays and where the, in the future holo holograms are coming out of your phones, for example, thereby you're able to have much more three-dimensional interaction with your family and friends, giving, enhancing that experience, being there despite being physically quite far away, particularly knowing that in the pandemic area times, you're not able to travel physically, but still it can enhance our interactions. Wearable optical sensors, light navigation and communication, for example, LIDAR, and also 3D vision and gesture recognition and enhanced machine vision and augmented reality. And all these technologies require smart and miniaturized optical systems. So as a Australian Research Council funded center of excellence, we have been really looking at as the something called TMOS. We have been looking at uh, the generation of light using nanostructures manipulation of light using meta optics and using nanostructures and detection of light using nanostructures, thereby you'll be able to really manipulate the light and you'll be able to really get the functions like holograms coming out of your phones. Our Li-Fi technology like Wi-Fi we have been using, in the future we'll be using light-based fidelity communications, Li-Fi's and using LED technology or laser technology, for example, and also LiDAR, which I've already mentioned, and we are really working towards making some of these technologies 
This particular center has been led by my young colleague, Professor Ragamed Neshev, and we also have got about five different universities participating in this, in this center, and about 10 to 15 international universities are also participating in this uh, center, including Caltech and uh, uh, Harvard, and uh, also the Oxford and Cambridge and uh, many other universities. Opt electronics. And as you know that semiconductors have played a very important role in the case of electronics. And uh, so the, all of us are using electronics today. If you're using your laptop or otherwise any electronic device, most likely that might have been made out of silicon, which has been widely used. But unfortunately, silicon is not a very good light emitter. And uh, so that means it's because it's an indirect band gap semiconductor. You need to have a direct band gap semiconductors to emit light. So that's where the compound semiconductors of 3-5 semiconductors comes into picture of gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, gallium nitride, indium nitride, gallium antimonide, and different materials have got different band gaps. Band gap is the energy difference between the bottom of the conduction band and the top of the valence band. By choosing different materials, you're able to create different colors of light from the ultraviolet to the visible to the infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And optical electronics is essentially conversion of electricity into light using light emitting diodes and lasers and conversion of light into electricity for solar cells and photo detectors, for example. So the developments in the nitride technology has led to the blue LEDs, which was a missing link uh, uh, for about, uh, about till mid nineties or so. And then in fact, three Japanese scientists won the Nobel prize in 2014 for physics for the development of this blue LED technology, because in the past we had red LEDs and green LEDs, and then missing link was another three uh, primary color blue LED was missing. By combining these three different colors, we were able to create white lights, for example, or otherwise even using UV LEDs and then phosphors also can create white light. Now, nowadays we're all using LED based lighting, for example. Many of my students, in fact, are manufacturing in various parts of the world millions of LEDs per month. The same materials which are used for making LEDs can also be used for lasers. And again, we are making use of these materials for making wide variety of lasers, which I will come back to. And also that uh, and because of the development of these LED technology, now large area displays and also high brightness LEDs and high brightness TVs and other things are really now being used widely. For example, this is an example of in the uh, New York Times Square, uh, Times Square, even during the broad daylight, you can see the TV because of the high brightness uh, TV development or so. This, also that solid state lighting is really playing an important role due to the development of this LED technology. So the same materials could also be used for detection of light. For example, solar cells, these multi-junction solar cells made out of three, five uh, semiconductors nowadays have exceeded 47% efficiency. And mainly these are developed for space applications because they're expensive. So now people are thinking about how can we use it for terrestrial applications where you can have a solar concentrator system. And then here you're focusing the light here at this focal point of the mirrors here. And then you want to have the most efficient solar cell because of the fact that this tracking system itself costs money. So that's where three pi semiconductors have been exposed for the, explored for the concentrator photovoltaic systems. And also people have been developing infrared detectors which are used for night vision applications and biomedical imaging applications and also manufacturing applications where you can look at the way the heat is generated in a computer chip, for example, so that the chip designers will be able to redistribute the transistors so that you can minimize the heat generation. That's a major issue. But also these lasers and detectors are widely used in the optical fiber communications. And uh, as today I'm able to talk to you because of the fact that the electrical signals from my computer are converted into optical signals using lasers and they have been sent through optical fibers. And on your end, you're able to convert those optical signals into light signals using infrared detect detectors, for example, here. So these material, these lasers and photo detectors are made out of these three, five compound semiconductors. Typically they are operating in the 1.3, 1.5 micron wavelength is an infrared in the spectrum, because that's where you got the lowest absorption and uh, dispersion takes place. That's why we end up using these infrared lasers and detectors, for example, which I will come back to. So now let me move towards nanowires. Nanowires are seen as building blocks for the next generation electronics and photonics. And what is so special about nanowires? What is, I mean, we have been working on 
quantum wells and quantum dots and nanocrystals, sometimes people call it for a long time. And what is so special about nano wells? It turns out the lattice mismatch is no longer an issue between the nano wire material which you are really growing and then the lattice constant of the substrate. What is lattice constant? Lattice constant is a unit cell of the crystal which repeats itself in a crystal. If the lattice constant differences are too high, the layer which you're depositing, for example, really relaxes back at your original lattice constant to create a lot of defects and dislocations. So those materials are not very good for making off electronic devices. Because of their nanoscale and three-dimensional architecture, and these nano wires either expand or contract if they have got a larger lattice constant or smaller lattice constant with respect to the substrate. So that means, in principle, you should be able to grow nano wires of any material on any substrate without the constraints of lattice mismatch. You can also create axial heterostructures. These green materials are different than the red material. You can also create PN junctions within the nano wire, which I will come back to. Also, you can create radial heterostructures of the core shell nano wires which really opens up a lot of opportunities for making quantum well tubes and wide variety of devices. And also you can make branch nano ones. So that means it really opens up opportunities for, us, for you to be able to make three-dimensional architectures. So now you can see, in fact, uh, in our own laboratory, we have demonstrated a wide variety of these nano wires of the gallium antimonide, which has grown on top of gallium arsenide, la despite large lattice mismatch. We have shown excellent atomically perfect gallium antimonide on top of gallium arsenide. For indium arsenide, which has been get a branch nano wise, which can be used as cantilevers or scanning probes, for example. Nano trees, which are very good for indium phosphide in this case, of really for energy harvesting applications, and also really going from nano wise to nano membranes, and so really exploring wide variety of nano structures for a wide variety of applications, for example. And in fact, there are many reports in the literature which I will share with you of the nano wire based LEDs, lasers, and photodetectors, and biosensors, and solar cells. But also, most recently, and people have been really developing at IBM Zurich, for example, growing indium gallium arsenide nano wires on silicon, six inch papers, where they demonstrated excellent performance from these indium gallium arsenide nano wire transistors, indicating that they're also going to play an important role in the electronics as well. So, if the nano wires are so much of importance, how do you make these nano? There are two main techniques which we use. One is called a metal catalyzed VLS growth process, vapor liquid solid growth mechanism. And another thing is called a selective air epitaxy. And we mainly use something called a metal organic chemical vapor deposition, MOCVD. Also, there's an alternative technique called a molecular beam epitaxy. Depending on the applications you can go and choose and what facilities you have, you end up going and choosing a particular technique. And we have chosen MOCVD because MOCVD is a technique which is used in the optoelectronics industry for manufacturing LEDs and lasers and the various optoelectronic devices. So in the case of this VLS growth process, we use metal nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, for example, as small as 10 nanometers up to as big as 300 nanometers. I'm giving an example of the nanoparticles of about 50 nanometers in diameter. So gold has got a very high melting temperature, more than 1,000 degrees Celsius. But once gold reacts with the gallium or aluminum or indium, then what happens is the alloy melting temperature comes down to as small as 350 degrees Celsius. So now we put this in gold nanoparticles on top of gallium arsenide, for example, put this into the MOCVD reactor, heat it somewhere between 370 to 500 degrees Celsius, and then you are really creating, in this case, creating the gold gallium eutectic liquid, alloy liquid, and then you introduce the gases needed for the growth of gallium arsenide, trimethyl gallium and arsine, and then they end up incorporating this liquid alloy it gets super saturated, crystal start this thing out, for example. So really, this is like, you know, you put, essentially it's dissolving sugar in the water and up to solubility limit, sugar really dissolves and above that it starts crystallizing or precipitating out. That's what exactly is happening in this case. Here is an example of the 50 nanometer gallium arsenide nanowise grown by my former student, Dr. Hannah Joyce, when she was doing her PhD at the ANU. And now she's an associate professor at Cambridge University, where she has demonstrated excellent performance gallium arsenide nanowires, and also showing atomically perfect nanowires. Diameter of the nanowire is essentially determined by the diameter of the nanoparticle which you're choosing. We made the, nan the nanowires as small as 10 nanometers, as big as 300 nanometers. Depending on the applications, you go and choose the diameter of the nanowires which you want to make. 
The second technique which we use is uh, we do not use any metal nanoparticles here. We call it as selective epitaxy. In this case, we deposit some silicon dioxide on top of uh, semiconductor, put some photoresist, do electron beam lithography, create patterns of holes. We transfer those holes through silicon dioxide so that semiconductor is exposed in those holes. In this case, I'm giving an example of indium phosphide. Then we put this one into the amosivity reactor, heat it up to 650 to 750 degrees Celsius, and introduces the growth for the growth of gases needed for the growth of indium phosphide, trimethyl indium and phosphine. These gases dissociate, and then crystal starts precipitating out in the holes which you create. You can see, you can see the beautiful ordered patterns of these indium phosphide nanowires. And you can see from the top view, beautiful hexagonally faceted ordered structures. This is the work of my former student, Dr. Chiang Gao, who is now a research engineer in blue glass in Sydney. We've taken these nanowires and of indium phosphide and excited them with the laser pulse to generate electron hole pairs. And then look at the, how the electron hole pairs are recombining and then emitting light. And we quantify the quantum efficiency of the light emission as a function of the laser excitation power. And you can see the red curve is for the indium phosphide nanowires, which are showing about quantum efficiency of about 50%. And then we also show the blue curve, which is for the epitaxial layers, which are in the two dimensional layers. You can see both of them have got a similar quantum efficiencies, indicating that in the case of nanowires, the defects which are created are the surfaces, surface broken bonds at the surface do not play a significantly detrimental role in the case of indium phosphide. That is not always the case. For, for example, in the case of gallium arsenide, that they really create a havoc, which I will not have time to go into the details. So we asked ourselves, if you really open a hole in this mask, we can make the nano wires. What will happen if you make other shapes? What will happen if you open a slot? What will happen if you open a ring? There's a work of my student, Dr. Nain Wong, and then who is now a postdoc in the group and did PhD during his PhD. He's taken indium phosphide substrate, deposit silicon dioxide, put some photoresist, do electron lithography, and create these patterns of these uh, slots and then the rings, and in addition to the holes, and then see what type of structures you can really get. Again, he spent a lot of time optimizing various growth parameters like the reactor pressure, temperature, and pi ratio, and various flows and all which I'll not have time to go into the details of that one. I'll just give you the summary of what he's achieved during the four years of his PhD. This particular work has been associated with my colleagues, which I have listed them here as well. So here is a case when the slot is open along particular crystallographic orientation, and this one put into the MOCVD reactor, and again, heat it up to 650 to 750 degrees Celsius, introduce the gases needed for the growth of indium phosphide. You can see, you can create these beautiful nano membranes of indium phosphide, with these sidewall crystal facets. If you open the slot along another crystallographic orientation, and then you also create the membranes, but these membranes are thicker than these ones, and also they got a different facet. But if you open the slot in between those two crystallographic orientations, suddenly you start creating these nano diamonds, and then you can have these side facets being alternating between these two. So now you can see instead of just making nano wires, we're able to make thin nano membranes, thick nano membranes, nano diamonds. It really opens some opportunities for us to be able to make a wide variety of nanostructures. So let's move to the what will happen if you open a ring. Well, if you open a ring, and again you really grow these structures, you can see you can create a beautiful ring-like structures with these alternating facets, which I've shown you earlier. Again, I won't go into the details of all these uh, various parameters uh, the nine wong has uh, varied in order to be able to get these nice and beautiful structures and. Uh, by the way, this is just a point I want to make is, I'm flicking through slide after slide. For each slide, probably a PhD student or a postdoc might have spent a year or two sometimes in order to be able to get those good results. And particularly students, those are working in the lab, I just want you to let you know that not you know every experiment which you started off is going to work. You need to have the patience and perseverance in order to be able to really produce nice results. So we keep on growing. And then you end up creating this, filling this gap here. You end up creating this horizontal uh, the membranes here. And then, of course, if you keep on growing, you finish off with these nice hexagonal facets structures because crystals always likes to really go into the low energy facets, and that's what it really creates. Now you can see I've shown you vertically standing facet, uh, then membranes. Now I'm showing you the horizontally oriented membranes. Then for MEMS applications and other things, we may want to make use of them. 
including ring resonator lasers and other things which I will come back and then share with you. So in fact, Nain Wong has taken these nanostructures of the nanomembranes, nanodiamonds, and nano rings, and then tried to do something called a cathode luminescence. In this case, he excites the electrons from the valence band to the convection band using the electron beam rather than a laser in the case of photoluminescence, and then look at the light emission. You can see very bright light emission coming from these, all these nanostructures, indicating that these four years of hard work really paid off. You can able to really create a defect-free beautiful nanostructures of wide variety of structures, which are these sorts of structures are very useful for making devices, which I'll come back and then share with you. So till now, I've only spoken about materials and how we can really control and then get atomically perfect and then you know, shape control nanostructures. Now let me move towards devices, lasers. All of us have been taught about lasers and we have been told that you need to have a gain medium you need to create a laser cavity to put in mirrors, and you need to pump the gain medium to create population inversion, and then as and when the gain is equal to the losses, and then the lasing starts taking place. These the undergraduate optics courses, all of us have been taught about this. In fact, this equation says exactly the same thing as here. Gain need to be equal to the internal optical losses and mirror losses, then only lasing starts taking place. So if you take a nanowire, you excite this nanowire with the laser pulse, and then what happens is that uh, the nanowire acts like a waveguide because of its high refractive index of 3.4. And then light starts propagating along the length of the nanowire. And both ends of the nanowire acts like mirrors because of the refractive index between the nanowire and then the surrounding medium. So now we can see if you design the nanowires correctly and grow the good quality nanowires, and then each nanowire in principle should act like a laser. So that's what our aim is, and then be able to make these nanowire lasers. And of course, we've been working in this area for a long time. And uh, you can see that uh, you know, means, uh, we have been demonstrated, we have demonstrated a wide variety of nanowire lasers. In fact, this particular work has been led by my young colleague, Dr. Sudha Makapati, who is now at uh, Monash University as an associate professor. And many students uh, have really contributed to this particular work and their names have been listed here, for example. Okay. I'll not have time to go into the details of all these lasers. I'm going to share with you one or two examples. So you see, here is a case where Drew Saxena, during his PhD, who is at Imperial College now, there he has shown that the how light propagates through his nanowires. And here we are showing you here TM01 mode, which has got the highest field intensity at the core of the nanowire at the, in a nanowire, which is about 260 nanometers in diameter. So depending on what type of optical modes which you're looking at, you can see that this TE01 mode, HT11 mode, various optical modes have got various shapes. Depending on the particular kind of laser, you need to choose the particular optical mode for be able to make these lasers. To cut the long story short, and uh, based on the design of Drew Saxena and another student, Dr. Jenny Jiang, now she's at Cambridge University, she has grown these gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide four shell nanowires, which are about 260 nanometers in diameter and about six microns long. Then we take, to, we take these nanowires and then transfer them onto a glass slide. You pump it the laser and look at the light coming out of these ones. You can see below threshold, you see a very broad light emission like photoluminescence, like a spontaneous emission. And above threshold, you see a very sharp light emission and like a laser, for example, okay? Coherent light coming out of this one here. You can see the output versus pump intensity. Again, this threshold like behavior. Here it's behaving like a LED. Here it's behaving like a laser. Again, log-log plot is another way to confirm this S-type behavior is the way we confirm that it's really true lasing is taking place. Here's the spontaneous emission, here's the amplified spontaneous emission, and here's the lasing is taking place. In fact, Bruce Saxena has gone and simulated what type of patterns you can see. You can see beautiful interference fringes because two coherent dipoles are emitted from both ends of the nanowire, and he compared the simulations and they match very well. And in fact, we published this work close to a decade or back or so in Nature Photonics by Drew Saxena. And then he's, then he's gone off and now working at Imperial College. Okay. So what are these nanowires lasers are useful for? They could be used for a wide variety of applications. And uh, for example, for sensors and uh, polymer optical electronics or flexible optical electronics and other things, which I will show you on how we are making use of these. So we are really working with our colleagues at University of Strathclyde, which is the Martin Dawson's group, and where they develop technique called nanoscale transfer printing technique. 
So in this case, they come up with a PDMS stamp. They can pick up these nanowires and then locate them wherever you want them to be. So precise nanoscale location of these nanowire lasers, depending on the applications which you have, for example. So here is a case where they transfer them onto flexible glass. And then you can see that there's a four nanowires here, three nanowires there, two nanowires there. And then, and then we pump them and then look at the light emission. You can see light is coming from the both ends of the nanowire because of the fact that each nanowire acts like a fabric bed of cavity. And then you can also see very sharp light emission or a narrow line width, which is indicating it's a laser. Again, pressure-like behavior indicating that they, they, all these nanowires are lasing, indicating that this transfer process is a gentle process. They're not creating any damage during this transfer process, for example. So they've transferred these nanowire lasers in front of this wide junction at polymer waveguide, SV8 waveguide for polymer optoelectronics applications. And we keep these nanowires here and excite them and look at the light coming at the other end. And you can really see the bright light coming on the other end, indicating that they are very useful for multiplexing and demultiplexing applications. And you can make use of them to be able to, for example, you can couple this one to an optical fiber, for example, multiple lasers for a wide variety of applications which we're really exploring at this stage. And again, Dimitar Geotics in their group, a PhD student, spend a lot of time in optimizing these things. So then we asked them, can you be able to locate these nanowires into nano antennas using this transfer free technology? This is the work of my young colleague, Fang Fang Ren, Professor Fang Fang Ren. Now she's at a professor at triple professor at Nanjing University, and she spent some time in my group. She has been making something called terahertz metamaterials. And then these nano materials have got these nano antennas. There was a gap in the middle, and we asked them whether we were able to locate these nanowires in the middle of this gap here. You can see the close up of this particular one. Here is a nano antenna. Here is a nanowire which is sitting here. If you do not have the nano antenna, light is coming from the both ends of the nanowire, as I shown you, because it acts like a fabric bed cavity. But when you put the nano antenna, suddenly light is coming from the vertical direction from the top, for example. So it's for, we are able to demonstrate vertically emitting nanowire lasers by using this combination of nano antennas and nano wires, for example, here. So again, depending on the applications, you make use of them for various applications. So if you want to couple the light to an optical waveguide or optical fiber, you make use of these emitting lasers because it becomes easier to couple them. But if you want to use it for, for example, facial recognition applications, which you are using it in iPhones and other devices, for example, or meta optics applications, you want to have the light to be coming out, even including laser displays and other things, and that's where you end up having these vertical emitting nanowire lasers, depending on the application to choose a particular kind of lasers, for example. And uh, so now let me finish off with this laser part of it. And then again, I told you that we are creating these zinc resonators and this work of my new student, Wei Wong, and where he has designed the diameter of the nanowire, what should be the diameter of the nanowire, what should the width of the nanowire, uh, the nano ring, and then what should the thickness of the nano ring, and then based on these designs, he's grown these structures. And then really, again, these pump these ones with the laser and looking at the light coming out of these ones. You can see the broad light emission below threshold and a sharp, you know, the whispering gallery mode light emission of the coherent light, light coming out of these ones above threshold. And again, you can see the comparison of the, the theoretical simulations of the activity simulations, finite difference time domain simulations, and experimentally measured patterns, and they really match really well. And again, this threshold like behavior, S type behavior, you know, very, very narrow line with indicating that uh, again, Bay Wong's hard work really paid off. And then he is able to show that these ring resonator lasers, which are very good for photonic integrated uh, circuit applications or so. And other colleagues are also involved in this particular work with whom I've listed here along with Bay Wong. So now let me move from optically pumped nanowire lasers to nano electrically pumped lasers. So then, of course, if you want to make electrically pumped devices, you need to have make a PN junction, and then you need to really be able to make contacts in order to be able to make a PN, inject the current into this PN junction, for example, like a diode, for example, right? And this is the work of my former student, Dr. Nai Yang, and who is now at Samsung. And then you can see that he spent a lot of time during his PhD of doping this indium phosphide with a P-type dope and zinc doping, and then grown the indium gallium arsenide quantum well, that yellow layer here, and then has grown n-type indium phosphide on top of that one and made contacts to the both ends of the nano wire and using electron mimeography and injects current and look at the voltage, the IV characteristics. You can see that the IV characteristics is showing like a diode-like behavior. And as and when you're injecting more and more current, and then you see the very bright light coming out of these ones. 
And you also see the two emission peaks. One is coming from this top quantum well, or actual quantum well. The other light is coming from this radial quantum well. And uh, so you can see also these are emitting in this 1.3, 1.55 micron wavelength region, that's a wavelength region which we're using for optical fiber communications, which I told you. Also, smaller the laser, they consume less energy. Smaller the laser, you can switch them on and off faster for faster communications as well. So that's why we're interested in this. But now you can see from this one, you do not see any narrowing of the line with which I've shown you earlier in the case of lasers. You also don't see any threshold-like behavior which I've shown you here. here. And in, this, is, this is mainly because of the fact that they're acting like a light emitting diodes, not like lasers. You can see this particular work is also led by my colleague, Professor Lan Fu. So you asked me the question, why? You got a PN junction, you got a nice quantum well, and you're able to make good contacts, and you're able to show that you got a good diode. What's the problem? Why you're not able to make lasers? The problem is you need to make metal contacts in order to be able to inject current into these nanostructures, nanowires. But then if you put the metals, metals have got a huge optical losses. Then you create a lossy cavity. Because of the lossy cavity, you have to pump them harder. If you're pumping them harder, you generate a lot of heat. And if you're really generating a lot of heat and then a gain goes down, you have to pump them harder, it becomes like a vicious circle. So, so this really is challenge. And in fact, to a new student, Nikita Agrani now working for the last four years, solve this problem and replacing these metals with the indium tin oxide and then aluminum absorbed zinc oxide or conducting oxides with the hope that we'll be able to solve this problem. But it's been a really, really challenging problem. I'm hoping that the next six months or so, she'll be able to resolve this particular issue. Instead, before leaving, instead of making a single nanowire LEDs, it's also made array of nanowire LEDs. And then challenge is that how to make contact to the top one here. And then essentially what we do is that we fill this gap with the, in the, between the nanowires with the polymer. You selectively etch that one using plasma etching and put some indium tin oxide and a metal on the side here and then the metal at the bottom so that you can inject current and look in the light emission. You can see the IV character is showing like a diode-like behavior. Again, higher the amount of current you're injecting, higher the amount of light which is coming out. So one of the nice things with these ones is that you can peel these things off because you're embedding these things in the polymer material. So that means they're very useful for making flexible LEDs. Why do you want to use flexible LEDs for? And of course, you want to use it for foldable phones because people want to have foldable displays and foldable computers or so. So that's why flexible LEDs are very much of interest for Samsung and other companies. So that's why InSuit has spent a lot of time in really making this particular large area, uh, large array of nanowire LEDs. And then in fact, you can see as an energy is injecting more and more current, you can see that the, you can see the bright light coming out of this nanowire LED array as well, and indicating that it is able to really make excellent quality nanowire LEDs. Still, they're not lasers. It's still a challenge, and we're still working towards them. So now from lasers and LEDs, we really move towards terahertz radiation. Terahertz radiation is uh, falls between electronics and photonics. Electronics, you talk about microwaves and radio frequencies and millimeter waves. And then in the optic, photonics or optics, you talk about UV light and visible light and infrared light. Terahertz falls between these two areas of electronics and photonics. And one terahertz to just remind you that about 300 microns in wavelength, about you know, 1,000 times larger wavelength than visible light, for example, okay, approximately. So why we're interested? It turns out that the many chemical molecules have got signatures in the terahertz parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, including biomolecules or so, including some explosives and other things, for example. So that means you want to be able to detect these uh, chemical molecules and you know, explosives and others, and people are interested in using these terahertz uh, uh, systems in order to be able to do that. Also, terahertz radiation is reflected by metals. Nowadays, in fact, if you go through this box which you go through in the airports, we are not using X-rays anymore because X-rays are ionizing radiation, but whereas terahertz is, uh, is non-ionizing radiation, that means it doesn't create any damage to your DNA, because terahertz radiation is reflected by metals, you'll be able to detect the metal objects, for example. Terahertz radiation is also used for things like uh, biomedical imaging applications, looking at the cavities in the teeth or cancer detection, or for wireless communications where, in fact, people are predicting in 6G, these terahertz communications in the local areas is going to play an important role. And also you can look at the water content in the leaves so that you're only watering the crops when they need to be, so that you're preserving the precious resource like water, for example. This is a work jointly with my collaborators at Oxford University, Professor Michael Johnson and Professor Laura Hertz. And then we are really developing terahertz detectors. 
And uh, my student, Kun Peng, during her PhD, fabricated these devices and measured and uh, they, these detectors in Oxford University. Now she's a postdoctoral fellow at Oxford University. So what Kun Peng has done is that she's taken these nanowires, transferred them onto a quartz substrate, and made electrical contacts using electron lithography, and then comes with the laser pulse and create electron hole pairs, photocarriers, and then comes with the terahertz pulse, and electric field of the terahertz pulse separates these carriers between these two contacts to measure the photocurrent as a function of time. If we can measure the photocurrent as a function of time, you can measure the electric field of the terahertz pulse and also the conductivity of the material as well. So that means you're able to get the full information about the amplitude of the terahertz pulse and the phase of the terahertz pulse. And that's why we're interested in really developing these particular ones. And also we're aiming is to be able to make room temperature terahertz detectors as well. Again, to cut the long story short, and then during her PhD, Kun Peng has really demonstrated the gary mass night based uh, then a single nanowire-based terahertz detectors, and then later on, indium phosphide-based single ter terahertz detectors. And she has used something called a bauta antennas in order to be able to create a broad band with detectors. And in fact, here are the simulated spectra, and then here is the nanowire measured ones, and also bulk reference showing that uh, nanowire-based detectors are as good as the bulk ones, but they're much more compact. So that means you can really put multiple nanowire detectors so that you can create high resolution terahertz imaging systems for biomedical applications and also for security applications and a range of things, for example. So during the last three years and uh, by, during her postdoc, what she has been doing is that she has been looking at a polarization result that has detectors. You can make these narrow wires, these detectors which I've shown you, this uh, so-called bout antennas, and then the challenge is try to put the another detector in the 90 degrees to the top one, the uh, bottom one, for example. Challenge is to avoid contact between the top nanowires and the bottom nanowires. So that's where she spent a lot of time along with my University of Strathclyde colleagues. And as using their transfer printing technique, we're able to demonstrate this particular one. And so what are we doing with these detectors? In fact, if you look at a wide variety of any systems you want to do, and whenever you pass through an uh, terahertz pulse through a terahertz metamaterial, for example, this, this pulse polarization changes and then you're able to look at both X and Y polarization. So thereby you learn about this terahertz metamaterial or any system which you're really dealing with. So she has designed these terahertz metamaterials and fabricated these ones. And then here is the theoretically simulated you know, horizontal polarization should have this shape and the vertical polarization should have this shape and experimentally measured ones also very much comparable to the theoretical ones, indicating that uh, Kun Peng's three years of hard work really paid off. And this work has been published in 2020 in science and uh, she was really excited about it because of the fact that uh, she's really struggled to really be able to make these detectors work to avoid minimizing, avoiding the contact between the top and the bottom nanowires, for example. So also we, because these nanowires act like resonators, this is the work of my young colleague, Dr. Zion Li. And then basically you can really change the diameter of the nanowire and then the resonant wavelength could be shifted, for example, here. This is a theoretical simulation show that by essentially changing the same use nanowire as the same material, changing the diameter of the nanowire. So here is a case where we have in fact fabricated these structures, putting different nanowires of different na uh, nanowires of different diameters in these four regions here. And then you can also show that uh, you can be able to tune the detection wavelength so they could be very useful for multi-wavelength detectors, for example. And uh, in fact, uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at the University of West Australia, we have really taken a flower and then also imaged that one using this our system also. Again, this work is only published late last year or so. Again, hard work of Zion Lee with other colleagues have really paid off. So particularly sometimes when you're really dealing with imaging systems, for example, visual light, you may not be able to see some things with the fog, but using the combination of visible light as well as also infrared light coming from these various objects which are around you, you'll be able to really see through the fog and then uh, and, and also nighttime and other things as well. So that's why we want to really create these multi-wavelength detectors using these nanowires and essentially adv taking advantage of these nanowire resonant behaviors. So now let me come to the nanowire solar cells and the solar cells, all of you know about these things and uh, you can you create a PN junction and then really make it thick enough to be able to absorb all the sunlight. And then the carriers need to migrate long distances because contacts at the top and the bottom. But in the it turns out in the case of nanowires, you can make a core shell nanowire and then where you can have, a, you know, for example, N-type, P-type nanowire in the core 
and the n type cell on that one. So thereby carriers can be collected very efficiently. Light is absorbed this way, carriers are collected this way for the first time. They're able to really decouple light absorption pathways and carrier collection pathways, for example. Also due to the high refractive index of the nanowire, they also act like light funnels. Also they've got a low reflection properties. That means, that means you don't have to put any anti-reflection coatings or anything like that. Again, we've gone off and did a lot of simulations and look at what should be the height of the nanowire, what should be the diameter of the nanowire, what should be the distance between the nanowires. And you can see that the most of the current is generated at the tip of the nanowire, indicating that you don't need to make very long nanowires but typically about two or three micron long nanowire is more than sufficient if you're using gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, for example. And also we found that the nanowire diameter should be around 160 and 150 nanometers. That's where you see the large amount of current is coming here is the scale here. You can see the red means you're creating a more amount of current here. Blue means you're creating very low current here, for example. And then also the diameter to pitch ratio, which is the distance between the nanowires, should be around 0.5 or 0.6, where you got the maximum amount of current being generated. That's what we want to make use of. And again, this plot tells you the same thing essentially. Based on those simulations, and in fact, this is the work of Vidur Raj, Dr. Vidur Raj, who is now at Glasgow University, and uh, many students are involved and other postdocs as well. So, what we have done in this case is that we have grown this P type indium phosphide nanowires and then coated with atomic layer deposition of the n-type zinc oxide and then an aluminum doped zinc oxide to really make a better contact tissue. So again, you can look at this uh, band structure of these particular structures, and we were able to demonstrate the quantum efficiency of these particular nanowires solar cells of about conversion efficiency, about 17% or so, which looks very, very promising. And particular advantage is that because we fill this, again, the gap between the nanowires with the polymer, you can peel these things off. They could be useful for flexible solar cell applications in the future. We should be able to give you a solar cell which you can attach onto your backpack and be able to really charge your electronic devices and provide wearable applications. They are very, very useful. So that's what we are working towards. So we are also using these nanowires for hydrogen generation. As you know, that solar cells are very good for generation of electricity during the sun, sometime uh, when sun is there. But then afterwards, you really need to really charge some batteries or so. But whereas hydrogen is seen as a transportable and storable energy, and that's what we are making use of using something called photoelectric chemistry or photocatalysis. In this case, we take a photoanode, which is a semiconductor, and a photocathode, which is a metal. And uh, so what you do is that you shine light on top of the photoanode. And then what you do in this case is that uh, generate electron hole pairs. Holes come and oxidize water to generate protons here. Electrons go there and then combine with the protons to generate hydrogen here, for example. So really a simple process and uh, electrolysis, of course, you yeah, apply the electric field. And uh, in this case, essentially cathode and anode. And uh, so, but of course, uh, if you got the sunlight and then also be able to create uh, the bias also being generated because of that, you can also create a, like a, act like a, uh, you can also use solar cells, for example, in order to be able to really power this particular photo, photo, photo electrical cell, for example. So here's a case example of the gallium nitride nanorods which we have been using. Gallium nitride is very difficult to etch normally chemically. But it turns out that when we were using these things as photoanodes, and then their stability has not been very good. And we had to coat these ones with the cobalt oxide, which acts like a co-catalyst and also whole scavenger to suppress, suppressing the photooxidative corrosion of gallium nitride surfaces. And where we were able to show that you can really get a very stable performance from these photo as uh, semiconductor anodes or so, for example, here. So in fact, we have also been looking at a wide variety of nanos, nanowires. For example, gallium nitride has got a very large band gap. So that means you're not absorbing the visible light. We've been exploring indium phosphide and other semiconductors to really be able to enhance the performance of this particular uh, the photocatalysis process. Let me finish off the last topic of the brain drain. So this is, as all of you know, that we all of us have got 80 billion neurons. And uh, so these 80 billion neurons form into neuronal network. This is a work led by my young colleague, Dr. Vini Gautam, who did her PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru Center in Bangalore, and then worked in my group as a postdoc, and now she's the lecturer in biomedical engineering at Melbourne University. So she comes with uh, organic semiconductors with uh, neural experience, and then we really try to make use of our nanowires for this particular application, for example. So whenever you have got a brain damage due to some accident or something, essentially what happens is that you're breaking the neural circuit 
that means you lose some other functions because you're not able to move or talk or you know, eat or it could be any problem, for example. So we asked ourselves, can we be able to create a neural patch and be able to make the connections back up? So that's what we asked ourselves. And uh, so really, Vini has spent a lot of time in optimizing various protocols in order to be able to grow these neural cells. So here is the indium phosphide nanowire structure here, for example. And then she has grown these uh, rat neural cells here. Cell body soma is here. And then these neurites, particularly axons, really follow these patterns beautifully here. And you can see some of the dendrites which are coming also following these patterns very nicely. So essentially, these, uh, these nanowires act like a topographic guide for these neuro neurites really follow particular patterns, for example. Instead of using a single neuronal cell, if you use a multiple neuronal cell, what will happen? In this square, in this box is the one where dash box is the one where the nanowires are. You can see that uh, there's a multiple neuronal cells. This, uh, this, the cell body is here. And then you can see these axons and neurites really follow these patterns in the, in the nicely following these nanowire patterns. But outside, when you do not have any nanowires and the indium phosphide surface, these neurites really make random connections. They don't really follow any particular pattern like the ones which are here, like this uh, square patterns also here. So what Vinny does is that she does something called calcium imaging. He puts a calcium dye. As in when the action potentials have been fired with the neuronal cells, you know, these calcium ions are passing through these uh, neuronal cell, neuro, the ion channels, and then the fluorescence intensity of this uh, dye changes depending on the concentration of the calcium ions, for example. So she, then she takes this video and try to create correlation maps. If this neuron is fighting what's happening to this neuron and this neuron and this neuron and this neuron and these astrocytes and try to understand are these neurons are communicating with each other or not and then try to really better understand and appreciate and then be able to really learn more about how the, these neuronal cells work and ultimately how the brain works and how we can be able to help people with the dementia and other various things. For example. So here's a case when the Vinny has grown these neurons on a glass uh, slide, for example, and the petri dish, and where typically the neuroscientists use, and a change in fluorescent intensity as a function of time. So you can see that these neurons are all randomly firing, and you see very little correlation coefficients. That means they're not really communicating with each other. But whereas the neurons which are grown in these in phosphide nanowires, they're all firing at the same time. You can see change in fluorescent intensity as a function of time. You see excellent correlation. And in fact, uh, they're essentially what's happening with this, some sort of a synchronized and correlated activity is taking place in this neural network. And Vinnie presented his work about three years back at a neuroscience conference, and they're all quite excited about it. And they asked her what neurons you're using. Then she said she's using rat neurons. And then they said, how about using human stem cells? So now we got a fund project funded by the Dementia Australia Research Foundation and the Little Bar Foundation. And there we are taking the stem cells from the dementia patients and stem cells from the healthy people, and then growing something called a brain organoids or the mini brains, and we've done without microglia, and then measuring the, the, uh, the signaling behavior differences between the dementia patients and healthy people using multi electrode arrays and calcium imaging, and applying the deep neural networks that the computer scientists working with colleagues, and applying these machine learning techniques to be able to differentiate the signaling behavior differences between the two. And also, we are developing these nanowire electrodes as a, to measure the neuronal signals as well. Dr. Vidur Raj, before he moved into Glasgow, he really fabricated these beautiful nano, nanowire electrodes. We have not been able to test it because of the labs being closed due to COVID. And then we are hoping that uh, once Omicron is under control, we'll be able to measure these. And so, particularly, these nanowire electrodes are very attractive because you're able to measure the single nanowire signals rather than the summary of these uh, average of these multiple. Uh, the neurons functioning, which you end up using whenever using the larger microelectrodes, micro for example. This work is a joint effort between my group at the Australian National University and a group in Wollongong University and Monash University and multiple group, groups in Melbourne University. It's really a really wonderful effort of the multidisciplinary research of the stem cell biologists, neurobiologists, computer scientists, and nanotechnologists, and they're working together to be able to really address some of these problems of better understanding how the brain works and what are the signaling differences between the dementia patients and healthy people? Can we be able to start introducing the drugs and then see you know, whether signaling behavior could be changed in the dementia uh, uh, brain, uh, mini brains, and so that we'll be able to help patients of the dementia in the longer term. That's how that we maintain. It's a long-term project, but it's an exciting project, and I'm learning a lot about neuroscience, for example. 
In conclusion, nanowires open up uh, nanostructures open up opportunities for manipulation of light matter and traction at the nanoscale, developing new class of lasers and LEDs, infrared and terahertz detectors, integration of optoelectronic devices on various platforms. And uh, I've demonstrated to you nanowire solar cells and PEC water splitting, engineering the growth of the neuronal networks or so. Really, it opens up lots of opportunities, and we're having great fun. And though we've been working in this nanowire field for about 15 years, we still have lots of interesting things to do, and particularly in the case of applications or so, including, as I've shown you, some of the challenges of being able to make electrical injection nanowire lasers and other things is very much of a challenge still. And that's what we're exploring, and also using them for meta optics applications, which uh, in our center of excellence as well. With that, leave you with some information about the journal, which uh, Dr. Sudhit Kaluri has already mentioned about applied physics reviews. We only publish a select number of papers, and uh, uh, so about 90% rejection rate currently, and only breakthrough results in original research are authoritative reviews. If think for something really breakthrough, think of applied physics reviews. And a center of excellence, once in a while, we advertise postdoctoral positions and PhD student positions. Please keep an eye, eye on this website. And considering that I started my life in a very small village in Andhra Pradesh and uh, studied in front of a kerosene lamp and lived with my math teacher to be able to finish my high school. And then my wife, Vidya, and I have started an endowment to support students and young physicists from developing countries to come and spend some time at the ANU during their summer break or so. And uh, just keep an eye on that one. In uh, 19, uh, 2019, we had 52 students from India came and one student came from Indonesia came and spent at ANU. But due to, due to COVID last two years also, we're not able to host anybody. We are hoping that we'll be able to host some people in 2023. But with that, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thank you, Professor. So with your uh, permission, uh, uh, we are taking up some few questions. I request uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Mahesh Rava and Dr. Sirisha to take up the questions from the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful lecture. There is a question from uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran Subramanian. Sir, can you please uh, uh, ask the question to the speaker directly? Yeah, Mahesh, you can ask. He's not there. Okay. So the question is, uh, uh, he wants to know the role of nanostructured materials having different morphological and water splitting applications. So they, certainly the surface area of these nanostructures really play an important role. And then the larger the surface area, uh, better it is in terms of water splitting applications. But the next thing is that you need to have the transport of the carriers need to be efficient as well. And uh, so that's why you need to have the good quality materials as well. So that's why we always try to really make good quality nanostructures and then try to make use of them for exploring the uh, the you know photo uh, catalysis purposes of generating of uh, hydrogen for example the challenge has been either the materials are efficient but are unstable but are otherwise materials are stable but inefficient so really trying to find efficient and stable materials with a large surface area in order to be able to create uh, efficiencies more than 20 percent or so in fact my young colleagues are telling me that they've achieved 20 percent efficiency and we haven't published this work. And then they asked me, I should not talk about those things. And, uh, but a, this field is really looking extremely promising. And also we need to make sure that we are also trying to develop the materials which are of low cost as well. So that's a cost is also an important issue which we need to keep in mind as well. It's a good question. Thank you, thank you, sir. The next question is from uh, Dr. S. Natarajan, Nagarajan. Sir, can you ask the question if you are available? Okay, I think he is also not available. Yes, so, okay. Next question. Is there... so the question is, uh, uh, what, what would be the future of organic electronics compared to the, uh, the, the nanomaterials? Okay, the organic electronics have an important role to play. And uh, so the particularly the you know, organic you know, displays and others, we're already seeing them and organic electronics is widely used, particularly for flexible electronics or so. <laughs> Again, you, know, you make use of the right kind of material for right kind of applications, for example, now we are talking about the perovskite solar cells, for example, the one of the, as most of you, some of you are working there. And the reality is that the main challenge has been the stability, right? Efficiency has been really good, long-term stability, and most of the results which have been presented and published are really measurements are done in the few puts under the no, uh, the water vapor ambient or so. So that's why the, you know, that's why you need to create enhanced stability as well. 
So whenever you are making any device technologies, you need to think about efficiency and of course the dimensions and the size and also the cost as well. You know, depending on what your application is, you end up you really choosing the right one. Okay. Of course, organic materials have got an important role to play. And again, you choose the right ones for the right application. Thank you, sir. The next question is, uh, how you see nanowides from the perspective of in vivo diagnosis? Uh, practically, is there any bio nanowide which can be used for in vivo cancer diagnosis? So you see, it's funny, it's, it's interesting you ask that question. In fact, we're already using those ones. In fact, uh, I have spent in 2018 at University of California, San Diego in Professor Shadi Dayas group, and where they have been using these nano electrodes developed at the University of uh, in California, San Diego, and then measure, measurements are done on real neuro patients in Ma Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston by neuroscientists identifying particularly for the people, those who got, uh, for example, epilepsy and other issues, identifying which parts of the brain the signaling behavior is not, uh, is not good. And so thereby they're really able to go and do the surgery precisely. And uh, of course, one thing which you always need to worry about is the steroids, you need to make sure that the biocompatibility material which you're using. And then the second thing is also make sure that everything you're doing, make sure that well sterilized so that you are not really creating problems for the patients. Already nanowires are used for uh, the, uh, the uh, real, real, real world applications for real patients for measuring signals. Okay. Yeah, actually Dr. Satish is here. Hello, Dr. Satish, uh, you have any other things? Hello? Uh, yes, sir, uh, I'm audible. Yes, 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 yeah. Yes, sir. So, uh, yeah, the, I think uh, you, have, you have asked my question. I was curious, I am working on this uh, in vivo diagnosis uh, of cancer uh, using molecular communication, which, are, which is a different uh, paradigm of communication using chemicals or molecules. So currently I'm doing uh, research in this area. So I was wondering, uh, is there any practical nanowires which could be used for in vivo detection of cancer? So the, I mean, the thing is that, uh, the, that again, of course, depends on, you know, you know that you, know, you need to do the right kind of functionalization and, uh, and then you'll be able to look at those ones. And as you know that the you know, cancer cells have got much higher porosity than uh, the healthy cells and that's where porosity has been exploited for that purpose as well. And it's more of the functionalizers of the narrow eyes really play an important role. And in fact, uh, what we've been exploring is that developing these terahertz imaging systems and they use those ones because terahertz can really penetrate deeper because as I, as I told you, the wavelength is about uh, 300 microns or so. And then that's what we want to make use of and to be able to really look at the uh, you know, cancer detection or so at the early stages particularly. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. So there is a one more question from uh, Dr. Rajiv Senapati. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, can you? Sir, please read the question. Sorry. Okay, Mahesh, you read the question. You can, you can read out my question, otherwise. Yeah. And the question is: uh, Is it possible to apply nanowires in data communications in computer networks? So that's a very good question, uh, Rajiv. And uh, so basically, one of the advantages of these uh, nano nanowires is that uh, they are really small. That means you know they you'll be able to switch them on and off faster. In fact, uh, my students have used some of these nanowire LEDs, and uh, they've already shown that they can be able to really measure up to one gigahertz. And then unfortunately, we don't have the measurement systems to go beyond one gigahertz or so. In fact, we are now working with our colleagues at the University of Queensland, and they, they, have, they are more of a microwave experts. And then uh, they have to modify and they set up in order to be able to measure these things. And that's what we're working towards. And uh, particularly, if you can start really going to the gigahertz region, and then you'll be able to use it for data communication applications. And as you know that uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the supercomputers, and then the communication between the racks and other things are all due to optics, not due to uh, the electronics because electronics is too slow. And that's why they end up using these uh, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. But here we, we demonstrated these uh, vertical nanowire lasers. And then in fact, we want to exploit those things for you know, data communications in the computer networks as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for answering the questions. Now I'm handing the session to Professor Vinod. So thank you very much, Mahesh and uh, Dr. Sirisha. So now uh, uh, I request uh, the, our respected Vice Chancellor, 
professor v s rao to prepare, present a uh, memento to our distinguished speaker I'm I'm trying to put my hand so that I can catch yeah. it sort of you know anyway thank you very much uh, Professor thank you sir. And, uh, no, it is our pleasure sir it is such a inspiring inquisitive informative and intellectually challenging lecture which is the harbinger for many future technologies so we are indeed grateful to you I am also reiterating what Professor Narayan Rao has extended the invitation so you should visit us at the earliest then we would like to give this uh, momento physically otherwise we would like to send it which are okay. okay. so, uh, thank you sir. we look forward to the pleasure of meeting you here in person as early as possible okay thank you very much this side in, in camera sir professor rao and professor rao yeah. okay. thank you sir. thank you very much namaskar thank you sir Able you are able to see the momentum. You are able to see the momentum, sir. No. Yes, yes, I can see it. And uh, so the yes, okay. Anyway, right. but maybe Sujit can send me a picture of that one, a close up of that yeah. one. So yeah. that yes, sir. Sure. Sure. Thank, sure. thank you. Thank sure. you. I'm picture. really grateful. Okay. I'm really grateful for that. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. We will send you the picture, sir. Sure. Thank, thank okay. you very much. Thank and you. Again, sir. I'm grateful for the opportunity to really talk to your students and seeing all of you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you sir thank you very much thank you so now i uh, request uh, uh, my colleague dr pankaj to deliver the uh, concluding remarks dr pankaj thank you professor vinod uh, my warm wishes to our respected dignitary and all participants attending the university distinguished okay. lecture series now we have come to an end the session but once the T.S. Eliot said, the end is where we start from. And to make an end is to make a beginning. So it is a beginning to explore optoelectronics and its wide application. Firstly, I'm very grateful to Professor Jagbees for your valuable time to illuminate us on semiconductor nanostructure for optoelectronics applications. This session has inspired us to explore the nanowires and nanowires laser application. Indeed, your experience on nanowires and its wide application have educated us to explore this domain. We have learned more about active meta optic research. Different applications such as solar cells, LEDs, biomedical imaging, neuron cells are necessary for the modern era, where nanowires uses are significant. So we are delighted to listen to you uh, and this captivating research on nanowires by, with wide application as stated by you, is very uh, encouraging us to work on. Moreover, the excellent work done by your group motivated us to perceive our research and showed that hard work on the right path definitely leads to the beautiful future. I'm sure that our student faculty members of SRM University and participants from different institutions are motivated us by this session and learn more about optoelectronics. We are thankful to you, Professor for your valuable insights on op optoelectronics application. Finally, I would like to thank to the people who made this such event happen. I'm sincerely grateful to our respected president, Dr. P. Satyanarayan, SRM University, AP, and our esteemed vice chancellor, Professor B. S. Rao, SRM University, for their continuous support and encouragement to accept. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to our honorable vice chancellor, Professor D. N. Rao, SRM University for their constant support and motivation and mentorship. Also, I express my sincere gratitude to the Honorable Registrar, all the directors and the deans of the SRM University for their constant support throughout the lecture series. Further, I express my generous thanks to the organizing committee members, technical and non-technical staff, supporting staff, and everyone who have worked very hard to make this event successful. Further, I take this opportunity to acknowledge print and electronic media for excellent coverage for this event. Finally, I would like to express my thanks to all the participants of various institutions for their active and energetic presence throughout the lecture series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pankaj. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj.